Hello everybody, this is John Buck back with another Continuous Time Linear Systems video. Uh, Today is a fun video to talk about because we've put together enough of the mathematical foundations in this class to talk about real-world engineering systems. And the picture right now up on the screen is showing you uh, the system we'll be talking about today, which is part of uh, this basic radio. And specifically, if we uh, zoom in on the dial, we're going to talk about the part of the rep radio represented by that, that top band, which is is AM or amplitude modulation. So uh, let me uh, move over to the whiteboard and we'll talk a little bit about how that works. The idea between amplitude behind amplitude modulation is that we take some signal X of T that we're trying to communicate somewhere. So X of T is the modulating signal and that has the information in it. So in the case of a radio, that would be like the voice or, or uh, the baseball broadcast or music, or whatever it is we're trying to transmit, and then we multiply it with what's called the carrier signal. And the carrier signal is, uh, is a much higher frequency signal in, generator, in general, and so it's, it's like the, the signal of interest carrying the information is riding on the amplitude or the envelope of the cosine when we do that. And so a natural question we might ask is, well, you know, when, uh, what, how, how high does that carrier signal need to be to make sure that my, I get a good copy of my, my modulating signal? Uh, if I'm going to have a lot of these going on at once, we'll, we'll see one of the nice features of amplitude modulation is it allows us to transmit uh, many signals at the same time in different frequency bands. That's why we have that, that dial on the radio I showed you a second ago, right? As we adjust this this dial, we're tuning into different radio stations, all of which are present at the same time. That is a technique called frequency division multiplexing. And we'll say a bit more about that in class once we get through the basics here. Uh, and so the question of, well, how many stations can I have? How close together can they be? All that is, is not necessarily one of those things that's not obvious and easy to look at in the time domain, or even like, when do I have all the information? When does this amplitude modulation technique preserve all the information, and how do I recover it to listen to it? But if I go to the frequency domain, it does get a lot easier. So this is another place where switching domains makes something much easier. It's kind of, I think, a good analogy in terms of that overall picture is like when we looked at sampling last semester in discrete time, that if we just looked at time domain sampling, it was really hard to say when is all the information there. But once we went to frequency domain, the Nyquist theorem was pretty straightforward from just looking at the pictures. And we'll see similar ideas today about, about pictures. And in fact, sampling is a different kind of modulation. It's a modulation with a different carrier signal. So you can sort of build on some of your intuition from sampling here. So let's start by, by thinking about this as ever. Our, our, a key to this is, is our old friend Euler's. Right? I, can, I can use Euler's, or I can just go directly to the Fourier transform of the cosine. Right? One of the important Fourier transform properties we saw is that multiplying in time is Pause the video and remind yourself, convolution and frequency, right? So there's this extra 1 over 2 pi, but the basic idea is we're convolving the Fourier transform of the modulating signal with the Fourier transform of the cosine. And we've seen already the Fourier transform of the cosine are just two impulses. Uh, so now when we... Uh, Convolve, we've already seen, if I convolve with an impulse, again, a good chance to pause and remind yourself before I give you the answer. What happens when I call convolve x of j omega with an impulse that's been shifted? This impulse is located at omega c. What happens when I convolve with that? Right, convolving with an impulse is a shift. And so this convolution, when I distribute it through, convolving with the first impulse makes a copy of x of j omega shifted to the right by omega c. And the second one makes it by the left with omega c. Also, as I sort of clean up the, the constant factors, the two pi's cancel out, and each of those are scaled by a half. So when I'm done here, I get two copies of my original spectrum, one that shifted to the right by omega c and one to the left. And that just comes from convolving the property of convolving with impulses with a shifted impulse makes a shifted copy of the signal. So let's see... Uh, how this looks graphically. Oh, I guess the other thing I should mention before we go on, though, right, is is that uh, this also starts to make it clear if I have just one, the very simple case with one modulating signal and one carrier, 
how large the carrier needs to be so that I don't lose any information in AM is I need omega C to be large enough that these two copies don't overlap, that I get clean copies of the original spectrum. So let's, uh, let's see how that looks. Or rather, let's look at an example of seeing how th this looks graphically when I go through it. So imagine my modulating signal, I'm just sort of making up a little cartoon version, has a spectrum like this. That's a little little house type shape with, with uh, extra, extra extensions on the side. And then we're going to say, imagine that my and time domain, my modulation, is, is uh, at 10 times omega n. So it'll be much more. And so if I'm modulating like this, oh, and I should have labeled, imagine that the maximum amplitude is A, and this over here is A over 2. We've, we've just seen on the previous page, if I'm modulating like this in, in frequency, I'm going to get two copies that have been scaled by a half in height and shifted by 10 omega m to either side. Okay, so just plugging in for the, the carrier frequency here is 10 omega m. This is the same equation I had on the previous page. And so I'm going to get a copy of this shifted 10 omega m to the right and 10 to the left. So let me start sketching my y of j omega. I'm going to need a big wide frequency axis. So uh, I'm going to way up here, centered at 10 omega m, get a new version of, of my, uh, my signal there. Let me add that in. Right, so I'm centered at 10 omega m, and then the edges will be either omega m above that or omega m below that. So it'll it'll start at 9, because 10 omega m minus omega m is 9 omega m. And the upper edge will be at 11 omega m. And so that'll be the, the, the that's the uh, first copy here. Oh, and i got to label the heights. It'll be half of what it was before. So the peak will be at a over 4, or a over 2, and then the shoulders will be at a over 4. Okay, so this is my, my positive shifted copy. Then I'll make the same thing, just reversed, you know, from the second term here. This this, uh, this term right here will make a second copy at, at uh, minus 10 omega. So, the, so now I have the similar symmetric copy at negative frequencies as well. The important idea from... Uh, from this is that both of these copies are complete copies of the original signal. So when they've got them well separated in frequency like this, they are uh, not going to interfere with each other. And so I have all the information is, is available to me in the frequency band. I need to design a system, a demodulator, which is essentially what your radio does to move it down from the high frequency uh, down into the to, the to the audible band and turn it back into an acoustic wave that we can listen to. But in theory, I've got all the information there because I've got a complete copy of the Fourier transform up here at a higher frequency. I just need to demodulate it back to baseband, we say, back to, to zero frequency here. So in, in real life, we almost, we pretty much never worry about these, like a single copy interfering with each other. The whole idea of frequency division multiplexing is one you've, you've grown up with your whole life, the idea of different radio stations or TV stations having different frequencies. So we're usually more worried about making sure that this, this, this signal at 10 omega m does not overlap a nearby station that's transmitting circles, right? We could have another station not too far away on the frequency axis. Oh, wasn't supposed to do that. Right, and what we really want to make sure is that these two don't overlap because that becomes crosstalk or interference between my two AM radio stations. Um, and that will, will degrade the signal quality. So uh, that's why the, the Federal Communications Commission gets involved in telling radio stations which frequencies they can use for their carriers. That's what's on this dial up here. If I bring that back for a second. This is basically telling you what omega C is. Well, actually F. These are in hertz. So these, and, and these are uh, kilohertz times 10. So it runs from 530 kilohertz to 1700 kilohertz for the carrier frequency. So omega C would be 2 pi times that. And, and so each station is a different carrier frequency. And then we'll see in the next video, we'll talk about demodulators, how they move them back to baseband to recover it. Okay, so I think I think that's all for now. The, that, that gives you some basic idea. I guess I should put up the idea of, let me just quickly write up the idea of frequency domain. Frequency division multiplexing is the technique where we give multiple uh, signals, each their own carrier, so they can be transmitted at the same time, but be separate in frequency, preserving the information. 
Okay, so when this is this, this is the basic idea, every signal gets its unique carrier frequency, like I've shown here. I've got a blue signal. I could add another one, maybe. There's another one at a, at a different different frequency here that's that's transmitting triangles. And as long as they don't overlap in frequency, in theory, I can recover any one of them one at a time with the right combination of modulation and filtering. And that's what we'll talk about in the next video. So this one is long enough. I'm going to stop for now. And, and go on in, in the next video, I'll talk about the basic idea of demodulation.